Yeah, so uh, hello everyone. Welcome to the Maths Club Talk. Uh, sorry for any, any inconvenience caused. It was uh, there was some unfortunate technical issues. Today's speaker is Balaka Sen. He is a BMAT third year student. He has been an integral part of the Math Club uh, and has organized various talks and also given various talks in the past. Today's topic is Aboralism in Group Theory. Uh, if anyone has any uh, doubts, they can just unmute themselves and ask. Also, we will have a twenty minutes discussion slot in the end for any questions you may have. Uh, so yeah, over to you, Bilal. Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, uh, I'll the main reference I'll use is this is extremely strange. What is happening? Yeah. Ah, got it. Maybe because this. One second. <laughs> Let's see. Okay, right. So the main reference I will use is uh, trees by Sir. Okay, and there will be two talks. Today and tomorrow. uh so don't hesitate to ask questions it helps and yeah so apologies for any errors there will be many if you can point out them that would be nice and thanks for attending So the outline is for today at least we talk about basics of hyperbolic geometry then we move on to uh, say something about graphs preliminaries then we introduce scaly graphs and something about trees something about groups acting on graphs Sorry for background noise. I live in a noisy neighborhood. Ah, uh, and let's see. Then we'll probably prove Nielsen-Shaya theorem and move on to the Arborial Dictionary. That's roughly the plan. So let's see how much we can go through that. So here is a brief introduction to hyperbolic geometry. Let me see if I can change my. Yeah. Excellent. Somehow I cannot use. Okay, I can use it now, but that's weird. Okay. Strange. Yeah. So. So let me say something about hyperbolic geometry. it will be weird if 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 you haven't heard of it before but i mean i think some people are already familiar with it quite a lot so let me say something to balance it out the basic model of hyperbolic geometry that i'm going to use is the upper half plane so all complex number with imaginary part positive and the way i would describe the geometry is from the climbing perspective so instead of instead of saying what the what the axiomatic i mean what the axiomatics are like euclidean geometry you introduce points then lines circles so on and so forth i will just introduce what the isometries are so what are the things which are which are supposed to preserve the geometric properties of the space so this is kind of i mean backwards way of defining a geometry so for example for euclidean geometry it's all the translations and rotations right the affine transformations in hyperbolic geometry the isometries are they form a group it's called sl2r so they are all matrices of the form a b c d such that ad minus bc equal to 1 and it acts on the upper half upper half space as follows so a matrix a b c d acts on a complex number z and spits out az plus b by cz plus d 
that's all there is to it. So this is called fractional linear transformation. Fractional linear transformation. Okay. And you can check that this preserves the upper half space. So if, if Z is in fact a num number with imaginary part positive, then this, is, this will also be a number with imaginary part positive. Okay. And there are some fundamental isometries of the upper half space that I want to talk about briefly. So one is scaling. So this is, uh, this is in fact a fractional linear transformation. Why? Because you just plug in A equal to lambda here and D equal to one over lambda. B and C are zero. This is just a diagonal matrix. Yeah. Lambda zero, zero lambda inverse. You scale everything centered at zero. That obviously preserves the upper half space. And this is in this is an isometry in our geometry. So that that, that is, I mean, that, that is definition. Okay. Uh, translation by lambda. So this is this is this is the matrix. Um, what is this matrix? One lambda zero one. Yeah. So if you act by this matrix, Z maps to Z plus lambda. So this is a isometry translation. And a similar isometry is, similarly an isometry is a Z going to minus one over Z. So this does not have a classical interpretation yeah. But you can think of it as circular inversion or whatever. So this is given by the matrix. Uh, so what is this? Uh, let's see, this is C equal to one, right? B equal to minus one. So one minus one here, zero, zero. And what does it do exactly? It, well, it, it maps Z to minus one over Z. So it preserves the circle. So mod Z equal to one, it sort of preserves the circle there. And I mean, preserves, it, 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 I mean, it doesn't fix the circle point wise, but it maps this side to this side, this side to this side. Kind of inversion, something like that. Okay, so now now that we know now that we know what the isometries are, we ask the question: What things are preserved by the isometry? So now we are defining the geometry more classically. This is a backwards way of thinking. So what 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 things are preserved? The things which are preserved are exactly circles or really semicircles, because that's exactly what these 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 fractional linear transformations preserve, right? They preserve um, circles. So send circle to circle rather. So what things are preserved? Let's see. So arcs of semicircle centered at this mz equal to zero line. These things are preserved. So take take the upper half space. This line is not there, yeah. So this line is not there. But you can take a point on the line. On the boundary line of the upper half space and look at the circle, semicircle, upper semicircle centered at that point. And that uh, these things will be preserved under, 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 well, not just these things, but these things and completely uh, vertical lines. So these things are preserved under fractional linear transformation. So any fractional linear transformation will send a circle, a semicircle to either a semicircle centered at the at, at a point on the boundary or one of these lines that you can easily check. So these things are geodesics of, of, of the model because these things are preserved essentially. Okay. And the thing which is not present is the boundary, right? So this, this boundary is not preserved, right? So here, one second. Yeah. This bound. The, 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 so the, this this boundary is is not present, right? So, but. I mean. So a useful definition is to say what the boundary is, is explicitly. So the boundary is this. Um, it's called the ideal boundary. All the real numbers union the point at infinity. So why is this why is this a useful thing to define? Because any geodesic is determined by two points in the boundary. So if you think of the boundary as real line union infinity, then the upper half space is sort of like the disc. And there is a point at an infinity that we cannot see that is missing in the upper half space model. And geodesics are exactly just semicircles joining points in the boundary, perpendicular to the boundary. Yeah. And this, this kind of encapsul encapsulates the vertical lines as well, because they are 
they are geodesics with one one point at infinity. So some useful properties of hyperbolic geometry is that it it doesn't does not have any it it does not satisfy Euclid's fifth postulate. Yeah. So for example, take these two geodesics. So these are like straight lines in our model. But take a point on this geodesic, then this is also a geodesic which passes to the same point, but they and neither of them intersects this this other geodesic. So they are both parallel to this geodesic sort of. If if, if parallelism means that they do not intersect. So uh, Euclid's fifth postulate fails in this model. And this was noticed by Gosch a long time ago. And hyperbolic geometry is also negatively curved in the following sense. If you take any triangle, which consists of three points with semicircles joining them, because these are the geodesic arcs, then if you look at the angles between pairs of, semi pairs of these geodesics, alpha, beta, gamma, let's say, then alpha plus beta plus gamma is less than pi. Whereas in Euclidean geometry is exactly equal to pi. So triangles are deflated. So it's like the geometry is kind of negatively curved. Okay. And there is a use, useful classification of isometries here. So isometries recall are all elements of SL2R, right? Special the SL stands for special linear, if you didn't, didn't know that. So they are two cross two matrices with determinant equal to um, one. So I should mention as a remark here that this is not quite true. The isometric group actually is PSL2R, which is quotient of SL2R by the center, because you have two matrices, right? For example, look at one, one, the identity matrix, and look at minus one, minus one. They give rise to the same isometry. They act the same way. Z maps to Z for any Z under these isometries. They, they give rise to the same fact fractional linear transformation. So essentially, you should quotient by the center, but doing that at the cost of being less explicit because you're working with a quotient group, not just a genuine honest matrix group. In any case, matrices in SL2R have a special kind of classification. So they're classified by the trace. If trace is bigger than two, they're called hyperbolic. Trace is equal to two, they're called parabolic. Trace is uh, less than two, then they're called elliptic. Sorry, I should have said less than. So let's see. Uh, less than two. And why is this the case? Because you can see the fractional linear transformation corresponding to A if trace of A is bigger than two will be of the following form. So let's see if I can add a page here. Yeah. So, huh. so let's see. Okay. So, so we have seen three kinds of isometries already. One is the scaling, right? If you scale, then note that two points on the boundary are fixed. So one is zero. Zero is fixed because you're scaling. This, this is the isometry lambda zero, zero, one over lambda, by the way. And also infinity is fixed. So infinity is somewhere up there. Two points on the boundary are fixed. So these kinds of isometry are called hyperbolic. Because as if it's it's like you're translating along this geodesic, along this, yeah, along this red geodesic, yeah. It feels as if you're translating along this red geodesic. Okay. Um. So another isometry is we have seen is translation. Yes, just translating z z going to z plus lambda. That's one lambda zero, zero one. That does not fix anything on R on this boundary, but fixes the point at infinity. So it has one point at infinity, which is fixed. So the, these, these kinds of guys are called parabolics. And finally, we have seen um, Z going to minus one over Z, but there are more general kinds of things which are called hyperbolic rotations, which so let's see, how do I draw that? So we have a semicircle here, and then we're doing z going to minus one over z, right? So it kind of flips it around. 
and that that this 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 this, this, this transformation fixes exactly one point but not on the boundary it does not fix any point on the boundary it fixes this point i because i goes to minus 1 over i which is i so this is this is the classification hyperbolic parabolic and elliptic fixes two points on the boundary one point on the boundary and no points on the boundary but one in the interior so let's see. why these names ha huh, so hyperbolic because because you're translating along a hyperbolic geodesy sort of and parabolic i think they have they they call para, any, anything which is like unipotent parabolic right in general if you have a matrix group if you have an upper triangular matrix they call them parabolics they are one parameter subgroup of parabolic i don't know why exactly it's called parabolic but elliptic is clear right because elliptic is like a euclidean euclidean isometry it's like a rotation around a fixed point ah uh -huh, okay okay so intuitively that's that sort of how i justify it okay so here is a interesting application of all of these classifications look at the subgroup sl2z in sl2r integer 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 matrices uh, 2 cross 2 integer matrices with determinant equal to 1 okay so this is what you would call a discrete subgroup of a lie group okay so let's see how is exactly sl2z acts on the hyperbolic plane so i've drawn this picture so let me explain the picture so look at the points i and e to the power of i pi over 3 let me change my pen color yeah it's very strange that i cannot use a toolbar <laughs> yeah so look at the look at the points i and e to the power i pi over 3 so look at the arc between them yeah look at this arc between them um yeah so i want to look at what happens to this arc once i apply elements of sl to z right under translations of uh, under applications of elements of sl to z what happens to this arc okay so note that sl to z has all kinds of rotations and um, integer integer angled rotation so so for example it ha it it has z going to it has z going to minus 1 over z in particular for example so this is a rotation of order 2 so what happens to what happens if i apply z going to minus 1 over z to i it 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 stays fixed what happens if i apply it to e to the power i pi over 3 it maps to minus e to the power minus i pi over 3 right so this maps to this so you would imagine that this 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 arc between e to the power i pi over 3 and i gets mapped to this arc right yeah and similarly so these are all translates of this arc under the above transformation okay um for the more what happens if you um what happens to this um this line for example this line is what i mean what happens to this line if you if you if you invert it along this i mean if you apply z going to minus 1 over z so what happens to this line if you apply z going to minus minus 1 over z let's see so this point gets sent to minus 1 right this point because if this is 1 this is going to minus 1 and point at infinity is going to 0 so this line is getting sent to something between minus 1 and 0 so which is this semicircle it has to be a semicircle because fractional linear transformation right so that is what is happening yeah so this point is mapping to this point for example and what is happening to an arc let's say what is happening to this arc this arc must map to this arc right so if you finally draw everything so let me finally if you draw everything you will get a symmetrical configuration which is exactly this tree made up of hyperbolic arcs yeah so that's that's the that's the final translate so 
Ja. So SL2Z acts on this arc in a way that it translates it to this full tree. Yeah. Okay. And these are all. You can prove that these are all because I mean, SL2Z is generated by generated by um, one one zero one, I think, and the Z going to minus one over Z, which is minus one one. So I think these two generate essentially. So you won't get anything else. So you get a tree above, which is really bipartite, right? Because it has, I mean, it has two levels. Yeah. So let's see. So, so these are the translates of I. And the blue ones are the translates of e to the power i pi, pi over 3. So you get a natural action of SL two Z on 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 a tree. So this is the first example. This is, this is our first example of a group acting on a tree. So let's do some graph preliminaries. I mean, this will be mostly clear to everyone. I have a question. Groups are actually generated from Z to minus one by Z, right? With the map Z to one by minus one by Z. Groups are actually generating how? Sorry, sorry, sorry. Can you ask the question again? Blues are actually, blues are actually generating how? Z going to minus one by Z. Yes. Which matrix? Blues are actually generating by which matrix? What is generated by which matrix? I didn't understand the question. Maybe write the question on the chat. Okay, okay. I'm right now. So yeah. So let me move on here. Um, I'll I'll come back to the question if you if you still have it. Uh, so so here is what I mean by graph. So I mean, mostly this is clear to everyone, but just for the sake of explaining, I mean, so my graphs are directed. So this is this, this is why I'm, I'm I'm explaining what a graph is because. Yeah, so uh, right. So not uh, so a graph for me is a is a set of vertices and set of edges, and it has these kind of structure maps from edge set to to the pair of vert. I mean, to the set of pairs of vertices. Um, and it has a conjugation map. So I'll explain what what these kind what these do. I mean, so so what so what an edge looks like here is, so you have for example you have an edge E, and what S S E is is the initial vertex and T E is the terminal vertex. So every edge is basically directed. And not only that, there is a conjugation map. So what is this conjugation map doing? This is just changing the direction of the edge. So instead of instead of instead of saying that every edge is labeled by E, an, el an element from capital E, every edge is really labeled by E and E bar. Okay. So th th this would be my formalism. And what bar does is just switches. Right? So, so you should think of two edges between two vertices, yeah, something like this. Okay, so let's see if, has the question been posted? I don't know. I can't cannot see the chat. Uh, not yet. Okay. Okay. Just let me know if the question is posted. I'll, I would like to clarify. Yes. Yeah, sure. um, okay. So I hope the definition of a graph is clear from here. I mean, I don't know what to say about it more than. But note that loops and multiple edges are allowed. For example, I've drawn this uh, picture here where it's a directed graph with a loop and two multiple edges. E, E bar, H, H bar, these denote, I mean, each, each pair of, each conjugate pair denotes a, denotes the same edge. But just that, uh, I mean. The question has uh, been posted. Okay. So, yeah, so I can't see the chat, so maybe you can read it out loud. 
Uh, I, I translation can... to blue points and yellow. Okay. Translation to blue blue points to yellow points are done by Z maps to minus one over Z. Okay, let's see. Let's see if that is the case. Uh, the blue points. Hmm. Uh, see the blue. So see the, the the blue points are never mapped to yellow points under this action, right? Is under action of SL two Z the blue points are never mapped to yellow points. That that's why the, the action is on a bipartite tree. Blue blue points are always mapped to blue points. Yellow points are always mapped to yellow points. There is no, I mean, you are not taking the blue point to the yellow point. SL two Z just does not do that. Z maps to minus one over Z does mean so you can see right. You can just check. Plug e to the power of i pi over three to Z. Z maps to minus minus one over Z. What do you get? You get minus e to the power of minus i pi by three. So this 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 vertex. Sorry, should change the pen color maybe. Yeah. So this vertex is mapping to this vertex just by plugging it in minus one over Z. This is basic algebra. That means blue points are mapping to blue points, right? Yes, yes, yes. That's what. That's what. That's, that's why the action. Okay, okay, okay. I understand. I understand. Yeah, that is what the action is on a bipartite tree, You're preserving the color of the disk. Okay. okay. So I hope the definition of graph is clear, and the point really is that you want you don't want to fix a fix a direction, right? but note that. One second. Yeah. Note that you can fix a fix an orientation on the graph by choosing directions for each edges. How do you do that? You just choose a subset of edges such that uh, under conjugation, the, I mean, if you so let's say the e plus is the subset of edges. E plus intersects e plus conjugate trivially, and e plus union e plus conjugate is equal to e. So all you're doing is choosing one of these symbols for each. So for each edge, you're choosing one of these symbols. So that will give you a direction, yes. Directing it. A graph with no loops and multiple edges is called a combinatorial graph. So this is like a simplicial complex for people who know the term. A graph homomorphism is just how you do it in algebra. I mean, you, it's, a, it's a map between, pair of maps between the vertex set and edge set such that it commutes with all the structure maps. Yeah. Subgraph is just something which has, I mean, just some sub, some, something which, ha, which ha, has an injective graph of the graph of them to another graph. So gamma prime is subgraph of gamma if there is an injective, the, the inclusion map is the graph of gamma prime to gamma. Yeah. Isomorphism is if, just like how you do in algebra, right? There's a pair of graph homomorphism such that Composition is identity in each case. Automorphism is a self isomorphism. So these are some standard terminology in graph theory. And these are some uh, examples of graphs. I don't know. This is the, it's called the path graph of length n. This is the cycle graph of length n. And this is the complete graph. More or less everyone is familiar here see, with these things. So I don't, I don't think I should say more about this. So geometric realization of graphs, I didn't write it, but let's write it. So what is, what is the geometric realization? So let's say gamma is a graph. And the geometric realization is just what you'd expect. You take um, you take a disjoint union of the vertices and edges, the edge set cross um, cross zero one, yeah. and then you glue up appropriately to get basically a. Uh, a real life version of the graph instead of just some combinatorial data, you get a topological space where each of these edges are copies of the interval and each of these vertices are actual points. And you can equip this with a metric so, so that this becomes a metric space where each of these edges have length one. Okay, so that's, that's the geometric realization. And the metric is called the graph metric sometimes. Note crucially that the edges are present. I mean, they, they, they are not just a collection of vertices. Okay. 
So what is a tree? A tree is an onimpic connected graph without circuits. So circuits being, circuits are maps from, uh, so yeah, I should, I should have said that maybe. So a circuit is a map, is, is, a, is, a, is a graph, is an injective graph homomorphism from the cycle graph. Cycle graph to your graph. This is a, this is a circuit. Similarly, a path, for example, is a injective graph graph homomorphism from the path graph, or not not necessarily injective, but path without backtracking that would be injective. Is a graph homomorphism from P n to your graph? Yeah. So, yeah. Connected if between any two points, there is always a path. Is your standard? So, a tree is non-empty connected graph without circuits, and you can. This is an exercise. You can just do it that a finite graph, if you have a finite graph, and if you look at the number of vertices, and you look at the number of geometric edges, so that is not the cardinality of E. Cardinality of E is twice the number of geometric edges because for each edge, you're assigning two, two symbols, right? E and E bar. So if you look at the number of, number of vertices and number of geometric edges, then tree, if and they, it's then something is a tree if and only V minus e equal to one. Of course, these are finite graphs, not for infinite graphs. But if every subgraph is a tree, then the graph is a tree. That's also true. What is capital E? Oh, you meant small e, e, right? So, no. What is capital E? Capital E is the edge set. Yeah. So, so for each edge, I'm, I'm, I'm denoting an edge by a label from capital E, right? But not just one label, two labels. Because I want directions. E is like okay, going okay. from here. E yeah. bar is like going from here to here. So that is basically why I'm using this formalism. Because I don't want to get, get in the mess of, I mean, uh, directed graphs and undirected graphs. So choosing one of the symbols here will give me a direction. That's all. Just number of edges here. E, literally just num is num just number of edges. Capital E is twice that. Whatever. So a fact is uh, any any connected graph contains a sub contains a subtree with same vertex set. This is called a maximal tree. So for example, I mean, just if you take a triangle graph or just an edge here, let's say. Then a maximal tree would be, for example, just going, yeah. This is a maximal tree, yeah. It's a tree with the same vertex. Yeah. And the proof is basically Zorn's lemma. You can try to prove it. It's not hard. You take the set of all subtrees of the graph and look at this and, and prove that this has so in order it by inclusion and prove that this has uh, the all the properties that 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 you need to apply that you need to apply Zorn's lemma. It I mean it it has the every so it is non empty. Every chain has a maximum element and every chain has an upper bound rather. And then you get a maximum element and that will be a maximum tree. You can prove it. That's not hard. So take it as an exercise. It's not. Hard. Here's another exercise, which I like a lot. It's called the Peterson graph. So you look at this graph, which you draw by taking a pentagon and then taking points here and then drawing a star inside. This is three regular graphs, as in every point has three uh, neighbors. Right? Every point has three neighbors here. And show that this is isomorphic to this following graph that I've drawn. So how do you get this graph? You take, you take part of a three regular tree, right? So this red stuff is just ball of radius two at a point on a three regular tree. Right? So three regular tree I've drawn here, take a ball of radius two around this point and you'll get this red, red stuff. And then you join the vertices at the boundary cleverly. The point is that it looks, the Peterson graph, so there's nothing special about this, this root. Right. There is no choice of a root. Peterson graph looks like this at every at, at every vertex. So for, for for every vertex of the Peterson graph, if you take a ball of radius two, that will be isomorphic to a ball of radius two of the three regular graph. So it is a very good approximator of the three regular graph. So such graphs are called Ramanujan graphs. So let's see if I have time to say something more about it uh, tomorrow. Let me introduce Cayley graphs. So these are graphs which you can create from groups. Yeah. So I don't know how much group theory people know here, but let me say something anyway. 
Suppose G is a countable group. Choose any subset S of G. Now we can make a graph whose vertex set is exactly the elements of the group. And edge sets are the following. Take an element G. Suppose you hit the element G with an element from capital S. So let's say little s is element of capital S. You get some other element SG. Join it by an edge. And that's my edge. That though these are the edges of the graph. And of course, I mean, I'm labeling it by the pair G comma SG, also by the pair SG comma G, because I'm not specifying the direction. Once I specify a direction, I'm, if I choose one, I will specify a direction. But of course, this graph has a canonical direction because I'm hitting it by something. So I can choose G comma SG, and that would be a direction. Note that this graph is connected if and only if G is generated by S, right? Because if you start from the identity and you look at any element G, there is a path between them if and only if there is a sequence of S, the sequence of elements of capital S, S1, S2, so on, so forth, such that at the end, after hitting it by everything, we, we go, go to G, right, from E to G. So then I'm basically saying that connected implies G is generated by S and conversely as well. So this is kind of clear. Okay. There are no loops. When, when, when are there no loops? If there is a loop, then basically you're saying that if you're hitting it, so yeah, you're hitting an element by some element S and you're getting at the same element. So G S equal to S G equal to S S G equal to G. So S is identity, but if capital S does not, does not contain an identity, then there will be no loops. So this is also clear loops. If and only if there are no loops, if and only if there are no, there is no identity in S no multiple edges. So when are there multiple ages? There are multiple ages if this situation occurs, yeah? So G and H are here, You're multiplying by two things. Um, yeah. Uh, so G S1 equal to H, but G S2 equal to H will, will imply S1 equal to S2. So that cannot happen, but it can happen that H S2 equal to G, right? So that would happen if and only if S1 S2 equal to identity. But suppose that S and S inverse intersects trivially. So if you have an element of, of S, then it, the, its inverse is not, not there anymore. If you demand that, then there are no multiple edges. So, huh. so that's, that's, that's scaly graph. So let's do some examples. Let's see. Hmm. Yeah, so some examples you can try are ZN with generating set. You have to specify the generating set, not that. Uh, and say generating set, you'll take one bar, yeah? I mean, yeah, one bar. So ZN is written additively. This is, this is Z, Z over NZ, I should say. This is the cyclic group on elements. And you're looking at the generator. That one generator is the gener is is the is the set S. Then the Cayley graph will look like what? Um, yeah, you're starting at zero bar, then you're hitting it by one bar, then one bar again. It's a cycle graph, yeah. This is a cycle graph. If you take ZN cross ZN, that's interesting. With one zero and zero bar as your set, then the Cayley graph will look like. Well, you can check this, but that that look like I mean it look like the cycle, but at each point of the cycle, uh, another cycle will be attached. So basically, it will look like. So if I do it for n equal to three. So it'll be cycle, cycle here, cycle here, and a cycle here. And everything will be attached in a kind of total way. One second, let's draw this properly. Yeah. So it'll be a kind of torus, it'll be a torus actually. It'll be a combinatorial torus, a triangulation of a torus. Um, you can also try 
um, something like D2N, the dihedral group of order 2N. That will, I mean, you can try it. It will it'll look pretty similar to Zn cross Z2, but there will be some issues with directions. Directions will be changed. So as a, only as a directed graph, it will be different from Zn cross Z2. On a standard basis, of course. So here I'm choosing generators S comma R here. Okay. So, but these are all finite graphs. So what I wanted to do was I want to say something about infinite graphs. Kelly graphs have infinite graphs. So if you try, for example, Z2, what do you get if you if you if you get Z2? Yeah. What about Z2 with generating set 1001? Well, many, many, many of you have seen it already. This is this. That this is just the lattice on R2, standard lattice on R2. What about the free group? Now, if you don't know what a free group is, it is basically so free group on two elements rather. So free group on two elements. It is basically all elements of the groups are of the form are, are just so. So suppose you have suppose you have two letters in a new alphabet X and Y, yeah. And all elements of the group will be just letters on X and Y. Okay. So that's what the free group is. And you have X inverse Y inverse also. X, Y, X inverse, Y inverse, that's your alphabet basically. And X, X inverse equal to identity, Y, Y inverse equal to identity, et cetera, et cetera. So what would be the Kelly graph if you use just X and Y as a generating set? Well, you can draw it and you'll see that you'll get a four regular tree. Because this is identity, this is X, this is X inverse, this is Y, this is Y inverse, this is Y. Similarly, this is X, Y, um, yeah. This is Y squared, this is X inverse Y, so on and so forth. There will be no cycles. Precisely because it's free, there are no relations in this group. So if you, if you have done group theory in terms of generators and relations, this is exactly just this group empty set here, no relations. A cycle basically corresponds to a relation. So what you get is a four regular graph and it keeps going. Something like this. All right. Okay, so I think the I think these are the only two examples I wanted to say, because either you know Kelly graphs or I mean more examples won't help. Let's see. So trees. So something more about trees that I'm going to use in the second talk, not today but second talk. So you'll see the formal similarity between a tree and a hyperbolic space. So, yeah. So suppose T is a tree. We could take look. We could look, we could look at look at the at automorphism group of the tree. Yeah. So the automorphism group of the tree is all self isomorphism of the tree that forms a group, of course, and that acts on the tree. That acts on the vertices of the tree and the edges of the tree. Right. So I'm go, I'm going to. I'm going to ask what 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 this geometry looks like because this is again a group acting on a space, right? So it is it is in the Kleinian sense a geometry. So what is this geometry exactly? So equip T with a graph metric D. We have discussed the graph metric. You can define a boundary for this tree, just like the hyperbolic boundary. So what is the boundary? The boundary is basically if you look at this example here, this is a regular tree. And it's best to think about regular trees because otherwise trees can get really weird. So this is a three, three regular tree. The boundary is any any point which I mean, it's a point here, right? But you cannot draw it because it's not a part. It's not part of the graph. You go along any branch, and then you branch off. You, you go along. You choose any branch at any at any vertex. You choose a specific branch, right? and then go along these kinds of arcs. Then you get then you get then you get to a boundary point you can say 
So for example, the leaves of this tree, the, the, the leaves which are not present in the tree, they form the boundary because there's an infinite tree, right? But how do you define it precisely? You just, you just look at, just look at any path of the tree, which any infinite, any inf, uh, semi-infinite path on the tree. Yeah. And say that two semi-infinite paths are equivalent if they agree after some point. So if you have two paths, gamma one, gamma two, they're both from, let's say the semi-infinite path. So path graph, um, but semi-infinite, yeah. So I'm sure I didn't denote it N, let's say. Semi-infinite path graph. So this is this path graph, yeah. To your graph, uh, to your tree. You say gamma one and gamma two are equivalent if after some point, gamma one n is equal to gamma one gamma two n plus k for all n greater or equal to n then you say the gamma one gamma two are equivalent because this they, they seem to merge right for example if you take this path and you take i don't know this path they merge after some point right after this point they merge but there can be a difference of time so that that's why i'm doing n plus k so you look at equivalence classes of such paths, semi-infinite paths, and that is exactly, you can define that to be exactly the boundary. But conceptually the boundary is all these leaves here, which are not present, leaves at infinity. It is really a Cantor set like thing. So boundary is defined. Let's not discuss this point. Compactification is not useful. Um, the automorphism group of the tree acts on the tree and it is actually a topological group because you can equip it to the point-wise topology. Yeah? And that actually makes it a polished group, but it's okay. That's a technical point. I, I'm not going to go into it very much. I'll classify automorphisms instead. So what are the automorphisms of the tree? What do they look like? So there is a similar classification. Like, like we saw in the hyperbolic plane, there's a similar classification here, which is, if you take any automorphism, so, so let me let me give some definitions. Take any automorphism phi of t uh, of t, define alpha of phi. Uh, no, this is not alpha. One second. Yeah, this is L. <laughs> L of phi is minimum of all is minimum of d x comma phi x, where x varies over all points on the tree. When where I where by bar t, I I really mean the geometric realization of the tree. Yeah. RT really means so. I, I should go back to that geometric realization uh, page. Let's see. Have I defined it? Yeah. So this is this is called the geometric realization bar G. It's called the geometric realization of this graph. Written it as gamma here. Yeah. Because the edges are also there. Right? So this is a the topological space whose Vertices, um, which which has point, which has points, which are, which has continuum many points, right? The not not just vertices, but the edges are also the points on edge. Uh, the edges are also points in the topological space. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, Define L phi to be minimum minimum distance that of an automorphism take. I mean, so, so automorphism in general takes a point x to phi x, right? Look at the minimum distance it takes any point to. So if it fixes a vertex, for example, then this L phi will be just zero because x equal to phi x for that vertex. Alternatively, if it flips along an edge, right? So an automorphism can flip along an edge. So for example, um, take this graph, take this tree and just flip. That's an automorphism of, of this tree. And it fixes a point in the middle. So that point, since I'm taking the geometric realization, that point will be considered when taking the minimum. And so L5 will be zero. 
So here's another definition. Two two edges E and F of uh, each set are co-oriented if along any along the unique geodesic joining E and F, they or they are po they're pointing on the same direction. So for example, take these edges E and F. If you take the geodesic joining them, right? So this is the red geodesic. There's a unique geodesic joining them. Geodesic by geodesic, I mean a path on the tree. There's a unique path between two points, of course. If you take the unique path joining them, they're pointing in the same direction. So under an orientation, so under under once you fix an orientation, you see that these 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 paths, the, these edges are pointing in the same direction along this geodesic. Then you say that they are co-oriented in the given orientation of the tree. So the following are equivalent. L phi is greater than zero. There exists an edge where E and phi are co-oriented, and there exists a phi invariant by geodesic. Okay. So what am I saying exactly here? I'm saying L phi greater than zero. So A if, if and only if C. So what does A if and only if C mean? So what does the phi invariant by geodesic look like? It has to look like um, by geodesic is just a path going between ends, right? So it is by infinite path in the in the in the graph. By infinite non-backtracking path. So there is a by infinite non-backtracking path in the tree. The tree must look like this, yeah. which is invariant under applications of phi. So phi translates along this path, just like hyperbolic automorphisms in the in the hyperbolic geometry case. Yeah. So L phi, if and only if it's a hyperbolic autom automorphism. So let's prove this. It's not hard. A implies B. So suppose L phi is greater than zero. Then there exists some x such that dx and phi x um, is equal to L because minimum is realized. This minimum has to be realized. We can easily convince yourself that the minimum has to be realized. So this minimum is positive, realized and is positive. Let's let x0 to xl be a geodesic joining between x and phi x. Since phi x, phi x is different from x, there is a positive distance. There, so there is a unique geodesic joining x and phi x, right? which is not the constant geodesic. So this is the unique geodesic joining x. This is x and this is phi x. Yeah. Look at the first edge here. Where is the first edge going? Under phi. Under phi, it has to go to an edge starting at x e. So if you look at the unique geodesic joining x0 here and uh, image uh, image of x1 under phi so phi x1 sorry phi x1 then this geodesic in this geodesic this edge e and phi e point in the same direction right so a implies b so of course if l l phi is greater than 0 you can find an edge such that e and phi e point in the same direction they are co-oriented E implies C. Suppose E and phi are co-oriented for some edge E. Then I'm claiming that there is a phi infinite phi invariant by geodesic. Why is this true? Because, well, you can draw a picture and you can easily convince, convince yourself that if you have an edge E and you apply phi E and you apply phi and then you get the edge phi E and in the unique geodesic joining them, E and phi point in the same direction. Then you simply look at the translates of E under phi E e, phi e, phi squared e, phi cube e, so on and so forth, yeah? And then that gives you, it gives you a parts of a geodesic, right? So you get parts of a geodesic. And then you join the rest by, by geodesics in the graph. And phi has to translate around that because e goes to phi e, goes to phi squared e, so on and so forth. So there is, exists a unique geodesic Joining e and phi e, a unique geodesic which invariant under phi phi, yeah, which is just this. Convert, I mean, other, on the other hand, C implies a. There there exists a geodesic which is invariant under phi. Why does that imply that l phi has to be greater than zero? That is easy to see. So there exists a geodesic which is invariant under phi. So the picture has to look like this, right? There exists a geodesic which is the blue geodesic which is invariant under phi. Then I'm claiming that L phi is greater than zero. Why is this true? Note that if you take any point here, x, and phi x is some point here, right? 
and x and phi x has to have a positive distance between because because phi is translating along this geodesic along this blue geodesic so if you take any point and you then, then translate by phi then it has to move it has to move from away from x so it has to have positive distance here and any other point if you take and if you apply phi the distance is strictly bigger than this distance between x and phi x indeed take any point y here join it by geodesic with x look at phi y join it by geodesic with phi x then distance between y and phi y is distance between y and x plus distance between distance between x and phi x plus distance between phi x and phi y which is exactly the distance between y and x right because phi is an isometric it preserves distances so essentially that is the reason that so if 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 points along a geodesic for, if it's true for points along a geodesic uh, along which phi uh, just translates then it has to be true for points away from the geodesic as well because their phi is just sending points farther and farther okay so what happens if l phi equal to 0 on the other hand then i'm claiming that there exists some point which is fixed it can be a vertex but it can be middle of an edge as well so either either it inverts an edge or fixes a vertex so it's an elliptic automorphism in the hyperbolic language hyperbolic geometry language well um so why is this true because l phi equal to 0 implies that there exists hmm, that there exists some x which is um fixed under yeah so this is this is quite clear right because l, because, because the dist l phi has to be realized so there exists some x certainly for which it is so they, so l phi is realized so there exists some x such that l phi equal to dx phi x and this is zero if x is a vertex we are done but what if x is not a vertex well then you argue that it has to be some point here right but where can i mean so what can what can happen to this edge so so an automorphism so the automorphism has to restrict to this this edge right so it has to be an automorphism of this edge so all it can do is permute the vertices and also this happens if and only if there exists pairs of edges so there is there is an edge e and such that phi e and phi e are not coordinated okay so why is this true this is quite easy to see because suppose that x is the fixed point take any any point y which is not fixed under phi you can find such a thing if phi is not an entity then you look at image of phi, y under phi look at the geodesic joining y and x so that has to map to the geodesic joining phi y and x because x is x is equal to phi x yeah and then you look at just the just the edge emanating from y just the first edge emanating from y uh or in towards y yeah or towards y then this edge has to map to this edge here so this edge between which is emanating towards y is mapping to the edge which is emanating towards phi y but in the geodesic unique geodesic joining them which is this right because if there is a unique path joining any two points in a tree in the unique geodesic joining them the, the these these edges are not coordinated these edges are not coherently oriented yeah so this is a classification isometries of tree are either hyperbolic elliptic or inversions so okay let's get to the meat of the matter we'll prove nielsen schreier theorem um so we have seen two examples of groups acting on graphs up until now one is the cayley graph where the group itself was acting on the cayley graph right group was acting on the cayley graph how because take a vertex here g and take a element here h that was mapping to um yeah s g x so yeah this is a right action because you have to preserve edges the edges are given by g going to g s g right the edges here are g g joining g and s g so joining g and s g so if you if you are acting by h you have to preserve this edge so you have to multiply on this side so it's a right action that's important yeah and also there was an action of automorphism group of the tree on the tree so it seems that this notion uh, you can you should you should write a general definition for this notion and indeed you can um let g be a group acting on a graph yeah so what what does that mean 
So that means that G acts on the set of vertices in a way that, yeah, so G acts by automorphism to the graph. So for any, any, any element, uh, little g, any element little g is extremely strange. Hmm. So any element little g of capital G that uh, acts on x by graph automorphisms. That's the definition of a group acting on a graph. And um, certain kinds of action I would like to not uh, consider. So for example, these are kinds of bad actions, inversions. So an element, so an inversion of the action is a, is a pair of elements, so is, a, is a pair of consisting of an element little g of capital G and an edge E of capital X, such that G is equal to E bar. So it is exactly this flipping action I was mentioning earlier, right? So I'm not sure if I can draw here, like E here. And G is just flipping this edge. So these kinds of actions are called actions with inversions. I do not want actions without inversions because they don't fix the, they don't fix an orientation on the graph basically. And, and also you'll see here that I've mentioned that if G, if G acts on X without inversions then X by G is a well-defined graph, right? If G acts with inversions on an edge then how do you define the quotient? You cannot define the quotient. The quotient is defined as topological space but it's fixing something which is not a, a vertex. So the quotient is not a graph, well-defined graph. So it has to preserve an orientation above to fix and to, to give a well-defined graph in the quotient. Okay. Okay. So I'm not sure if I'm going to talk about this, this in, in this talk because I'm running out of time. So let let's come back to this one later, if we have time. Yeah. So here is my first important result: group acting on tree, not uh, not without not with inversion. So if I have a group which is acting on a on on a graph. Um, which is a tree freely and not without inversions. Yeah. So this, this notation G acts plus X, that means that G does not act with inversions and it acts freely and X is a tree. And I'm going to assume all these things. Then G is free. So you see action of a group on a graph is telling me something about the graph. That's uh, something about the group. Yeah. So how would you prove this? So for those who know algebraic topology, this is very easy. Because, well, <laughs> um, um, it's an action, it's a simplicial action on a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a simplicial complex, yeah. And so if you look at this quotient, the so quotient is well-defined graph, remember that. So this is, uh, G is acting on X freely. So this, this is only for people who know algebraic topology, yeah. So G is acting on, on, on this tree X freely. So I, I define the quotient and this quotient map is a covering map because G is acting freely, right? Um, yeah, so this is a covering map. Well, you have to check that it's properly discontinuous, but this is not hard. That is not really hard at all. Um, yeah, so then fundamental group of X over G is isomorphic to G, yeah? By standard covering space theory. But X over G is a graph. So X over G has to be homotopy equivalent to some wage of circles. And fundamental group of wage of circles is free. So G has to be free. Okay, so this is, this is kind of a very easy proof using, using some technology. But you can do it without technology as well. Let me come back to that later because I'm not sure if I have, if I, if I have the time to do that. To that. But with, with, with just some basic uh, algebraic topology, this is quite easy. Yeah. So I left a page blank because I wanted to do the basic proof. This is all in SER, by the way. If if I if, I'm, if, I, if I don't talk about, talk about it anyway, then you can find all of this in SER. The, the, it's quite elementary. You don't need to know anything about fundamental groups or anything to understand the proofs here. But it just becomes easier if you if you use algebraic topology. So near so an important corollary of this theorem is Nielsen Schreier theorem, which says that if you have a free group and you have a subgroup, the subgroup is also free. This is a hard theorem. This is not easy at all. I mean, it seems obvious, but it's not easy at all. But it follows from what we have done earlier. What, 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 so what did we do earlier? We pro proved that if you have a group G acting without inversions freely on a tree, then the group is free. So look at the action of the group G. G is the free group on, the, on its Cayley graph. Remember that we drew a Cayley graph for, for the free group, for the free group on two generators, tree specific. But it's also true for free group on n generators that the Cayley graph is a tree. 
calligrapher of free group is a tree and g acts freely on this tree one second your definition of g acts freely is there are no inversions right uh, uh, no 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 so, oh yeah so i forgot to define free yeah one second one second yeah, yeah. sorry 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 just one second yeah um i forgot to define free yeah so free here means that free action i haven't defined so this plus indicates that this action is without inversions free in the sense of like normal group actions or no no uh, so yeah I'll, i can just see yeah, a normal group actions just this yeah so gx equal to x if and only if uh yeah implies that so for 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 yeah for any x there exists x such that so let me see there exists x in x such that gx equal to x for some g in g implies g has to be identity only identity can fix the vertex okay so stabilizer is trivial for each vertex that's what you're exactly saying. exactly exactly that's true that's right that's right that's right and the this action the action being without inversions means that the stabilizer of each edge is also trivial so it acts both freely on the vertices and on the edges as well because the edges cannot be flipped Okay. Ah, okay, got it. Yeah, so it's free in the topological sense. You can just say that instead of saying two things at once. Yes. Uh, hmm. Right. So gamma G S is a tree because G is free. So G acts freely on gamma G S. Now restrict this action to the subgroup H. H also acts freely on gamma G S, but gamma G S is a tree and it acts freely. Without inversions, because the Cayley graph action of the Cayley graph, a group on the Cayley graph is also without inversions. You can check that easily. So H is free. So it seems like we did without any work. It's a one-line proof. If you have what you have earlier, it's a one-line proof. And an important corollary is is this index formula. If you have if you have a, a subgroup H of G, which is of index n, G is free here. Then the rank of H minus one is equal to n times rank of G minus one. So what is rank? Rank is so a free group on n elements has rank n. That's the definition. Free on how many variables? You can define it in many ways. There are so many ways to define it. You can abelianize it. Take take the rank rank. Abelianize the group. Take look at G over G G. Look at the dimension of over Z. That's the rank. You can say that. So rank of H minus one equal to n times rank of G minus one. Why is this true? well again it's easy if you know some topology so um one sec yeah mm, yeah so you can say that this is a consequence of euler characteristic uh, if you take yeah so if you take yeah um One second. So, if you take the covering space, um, yeah. How do I say that? Just one second. Yeah. So, I guess you can do this. Yeah. You look at gamma G S. Quotiented by H and gamma G S quotiented by G. Gamma G S quotiented by G is a graph, but gamma G S quotiented by H is also a graph. And this graph lies over this graph, as in there is a projection map from gamma G S quotiented by H to gamma G S quotiented by G. You quotient further, so this is the, this is this is the map map of graphs, graph homomorphism, and this is actually covering map of degree n because H is index n in G, so this is a covering map of degree n. So all the characteristic of this is n times all the characteristic of this, but all the characteristic of this is exactly how much? Uh, well, yeah. So all the characteristic this is n times all the characteristic of this. So let's see. And. Uh, Well, or or what is the order characteristic of a wedge of circles? You you can say that. 
that is exactly number of edges minus one vertex yeah and number of edges is exactly uh, how many circles you get below but that's rank of g that's exactly rank of g because it's free right fundamental group of this is pi 1 of g right gamma g s mod g fundamental group of this is pi 1 of g because gamma g s is a contractible thing it's a it's, it's a significant thing it's a tree so pi 1 of this is actually g so it has to have g circles if 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 if, if, if you homotopy homotopy equivalent it to a wedge of circles it has to have uh, rank of g many circles so this is exactly equal to n times rank of g minus 1 and this is exactly equal to rank of h minus 1 for similar reasons this is also this is also a tree h acting on a tree and tree is contractible so but again you can give completely elementary proofs of these things these are all in set but i mean it becomes one line when you do when you know some algebraic topology so ha ah, so we had we had an action of a group on a tree right earlier we had action of sl2z on on some strange tree right sl2z acting on this tree but the action was not free so what do we do if the action is not free in general if g is acting on the on, on a tree let us say this is a tree the action will not be free so what can it have it can have vertex stabilizers right so every vertex can have stabilizers it can also have edge stabilizers so for example in this case sl2z acting on this 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 weird graph what are the vertex stabilizers exactly maybe someone knows the answer what are the vertex stabilizers here what is the stabilizer of i let's say z goes to minus 1 by z that stabilizes exactly and that so that is so so you are saying so so stabilizer has to be a subgroup right so what is the subgroup um generated by this one yeah so what is the subgroup generated by this not that this order 2 right yeah if we yeah. apply it twice it becomes identity so it has to be z2 you are saying it's z2 right yeah okay there is an issue the issue is that you are correct in spirit so let's see so one second to the organizers does this meeting just stop after 1 hour 30 minutes or is it timed or no no no, no uh, it will go okay great so i have i have some time okay i'll try to try to wrap it up quickly one second let's see uh red green yeah okay so green is very bad option hmm yeah so you're saying that there is a z2 stabilizer associated with this vertex that's correct because that z going to 1 minus 1 over z fixes i but note that every every element in sl in sl2 r every every fraction linear transformation is represented by two elements in sl2 r right because we saw this example earlier identity and minus 1 minus 1 they represent the same element same fraction 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 linear transformation right so if you multiply all the on the entries by minus 1 they will represent the same fraction linear transformation because we are doing az plus b by cz plus d so in fact this z going to minus 1 over z has two matrix representations right so what are the two matrix representations one is one is um uh one here right and minus 1 here and another other is the just just what you get if you multiply everything by minus 1 1 minus 1 0 yeah so in fact there are two matrices associated with this z going to minus 1 over z right and square of this is yeah so square of 0 minus 1 1 0 what what you get when you take the square is exactly negative of identity right i think what that's what you get yeah you get negative identity so instead of z2 you are getting z4 here you see that right because you get twice the symmetries right because there is a overcount so is that clear why this instead of z2 is this z4 
is it is this clear wait what are the two matrices that correspond to this um yeah so the matrix the, so the mat matrix is so for 0 minus 1 1 0 for example is a matrix which corresponds to z going to minus 1 over z right but also this this matrix co corresponds to z going to minus 1 over z right ah okay right so there are two matrices so they you're getting two fold right so it will be z2 cross z2 right ah no but it is also cyclic so yes so you, this is what I was worried about that people have pointed out. Yeah, but this is also cycle, also cyclic because because just this is just generated by hmm, where is my two? Yeah. Oh right, right minus i multiple. Cyclic, right? So this is just generated by zero minus one one zero. Just take yeah. just take cube of this, you get zero zero one minus one zero. Right? Square is zero zero minus one minus minus one zero minus one zero minus one minus of identity. So actually, this is cyclic generated uh, cyclic of order four generated by this guy. This is not, it, 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 even though z going to minus one over this cyclic of order two as a fractional transformation, this matrix is cyclic of order four. So there is z for symmetrized with this point. Okay. Next question: What is the symmetrized with the green point e to the power i pi three? This is green point. Can someone say? This is going to be harder, I think. So what is the stabilizer of this vertex, green vertex? Just by looking at it, can someone can someone guess? Some yeah, will it be like some uh, one minus one by z or something like that? Uh, what did you say? Can you say, say that again? Say that again. Uh, uh, like one minus one by z. Huh, one minus one by z, one minus one by z. Ah, I see, I see what you're saying. Yeah, it, it will be something like that. One over Z plus one is, is what I was thinking. It will be something like that only. That's probably correct. That's probably correct, but. No, not quite because that's still an order to symmetry. Uh, oh, maybe it isn't. Yeah, yeah, okay. That, that, that maybe that is not like, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. the square of what I'm saying is the one, the, fun the function you are pointing to. So like they are similar. Mm -hmm. I see, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, that's probably correct. But what, what do you guess is the order of that element? Three. Yeah, that's correct. Exactly. That is what I wanted. Okay. Because there is a threefold symmetry here. I mean, if, if you if you just naively guess it, you're correct. It, it is one over one plus z, I think. There is threefold symmetry here. So if you naively guess it's z3, but of course you're you're doubling again. So it's it's z6. The order of that element will be six in as a matrix, right? So because you're doubling. So, yeah. That's correct. So Z six here. Okay, excellent. And edge stabilizer, <laughs> anyone? What is the stabilizer of this edge fixed by both things? Why can you tell from the picture that it's Z six? Because because you so you're imagining SL two Z is acting. So hmm, that's a good question. But uh, basically, this this geodesic should map to this geodesic. This geodesic should map to this geodesic. This geodesic should map to this geodesic. So around that point, this this rotational symmetry should be there in SL two Z. Ah, okay. Literally the lattice, lattice, right? It's like a lattice in R two, but it's 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 a very complicated lattice sitting inside the hyperbolic space in, instead. So all the symmetry should be there, sort of. It, this is what you naturally expect. Yeah, but what is the edge stabilizer? Can someone say? Okay, at the final moments of the talks, it's getting more interactive. Thank God. Can you give me one? To be I'm sorry. Uh, like, uh, are, like, it has to be fixed right over there. It has to be, edge has to be fixed by what elements though? Yeah, so like uh, because uh, it has to, uh, uh, we know that uh, yellow points can't go to the blue or red points over mm -hmm, here. Like mm -hmm. I can't go to e to the i pi by three. Yes. So I have to stay at i. And e to the i pi by no, three. No, I can go to here, right? I can go here. And this can go here. Oh, that uh, actually, I thought just that. Right? So, okay. so what elements fixes, what element fixes everything? What element fixes this edge? 
is it uh, zed mod 2z is it zed mod 2z correct 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 because 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 negative right minus 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 1 0 0 minus 1 yeah because it will fix both vertices and everything. exactly exactly in fact the stabilizer of the edge has to be the intersection of the stabilizer of the, of the vertices right exactly it has to fix both vertices so it has to because it's not acting by inversions because this this blue vertex is not going to the green vertex uh, to the blue vertex uh, to, the, to the yellow vertex like someone said before so since this flipping is not happening it has to fix both vertices so it has to be the, the intersection of this z4 and z6 and the only thing it can be z2 yeah so we have a full description of all the stabilizers here let's see yeah there we go so we have pq here points um, and we have a full description of all stabilizers stabilizer of gp is z, z over 6z gq is z over 4z and edge is z over 2z the intersection gpq is what i have written here stabilizer okay excellent now um some lemmas and the final theorem yes okay so Suppose that G is acting on X without inversions. A fundamental domain for the action is a subgraph F of X, such that X by G is isomorphic to F. So for example, in the case of SL2Z acting on the, on the tree, the fundamental domain was that edge between P and Q, e to the power I pi over three and I, because everything was a translate of that edge, right? So that was the fundamental domain. Okay. Proposition. Suppose you're acting on a tree without inversions, not freely perhaps, then fundamental domain exists if and only if X over G is a tree. I've written it this clear here. Why is it clear? Because F is a subgraph. So if, if a fundamental domain exists, say it is F fundamental domain, then F is a subgraph of X. This is a tree. So the subgraph also has to be a tree. F has to be a tree. So if F is a tree, but then F by definition, a fundamental domain is isomorphic to X over G. So X over G is a tree. Easy proof. So fundamental domain exists if and only if the quotient is a tree. Okay. All right. So now I want to state the, state the actual theorem, but before stating that I should say something about how to glue groups otherwise it, the statement will be kind of out of the blue one second what do i want to do here yeah huh yes okay so here is a here is something on how to glue groups alternative title would be uh, free product with amalgamation. So suppose you have two groups, G1, G2. Okay. You can make a bigger group out of G1 and G2. So how, how, so give me some suggestions. So tell me, tell me something that makes a bigger group out of G1 and G2. Product. Product. Anything else? Product is boring, right? Some sort of semi-direct product. Semi-direct product. Anything else? No? Okay. So let's see. Let me, let me say. You can take what is known as the largest product possible. Okay. These kinds of products, semi-direct products are restrictive. You can take the largest product possible, which is the free product. What is the free product? So think of, imagine this group G1 as some generators with some relations, some generators, some relations. The free product is what you get by just chugging in everything. Yeah. Okay. So for example, free group on two generators is obtained by taking free product of Z with itself. This is just generated by X is generated by Y, no relations, no relations. So X union Y, no relations, no relations. So just X union Y, X, Y generated by X and Y. Okay. This is called the free product. 
not true. It's it's a quite quite a subtle thing, but anyhow, what you can do sometimes is also I mean okay. What do you want to say? Um, yeah. So your 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 products. So why did I say this? This is the biggest product possible because your direct products and semi-direct products, they are really special cases of this this kind of. I mean, they are not special cases, but I mean, they are quotients of these these kind of things because you add more relations, right? For direct product, you're adding that S1 commuted S1 and S2 commutes, yeah. So S1 and S2 commute. That that's what you're adding when you're doing the direct product into the relations. Yeah. And when you're doing semi-direct product, you're adding more things, right? You're adding, I mean. That after using an automorphism, you're doing something, and then conjugation is the automorphism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is why this is the largest product possible. Okay. I will introduce a notion of gluing two groups along a subgroup. Largest, largest way you can glue, glue two two things. So how? So suppose you have two groups G1, G2, as before, and a a, a group which is a subgroup of G1 and G2, respectively. So in a sense, you have Embeddings of A in G1 and G2 respectively, just to not get confused. Fixing A and two embeddings. I will define free product with amalgamation. So how is this defined? Similarly, so G1 is joined by S1, relations R1, S2, R2, etc. Huh. S1 union S2, R1 union R2, plus. I have these kinds of relations. F alpha equal to G alpha for all alpha in A. Or rather, I shouldn't write it like. So relations should be written as just words, right? Words equal to identity. Okay. So elements here I'm identifying. So I'm identifying. So if you take alpha here and then look at its image here, F alpha. That's a bad notation. Alpha, F alpha here, G alpha here. I'm I'm pasting along uh, A in the sense that F alpha equal to G alpha. I'm saying in 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 the new group F alpha will be equal to G alpha. So this is called gluing of groups or amalgamated products. These are of course subtle things because I mean it's not clear at all why this group wouldn't suddenly be zero. Right, because you have you have you have two groups G one G two and you have a subgroup as well, perfectly normal. But once you glue it, it becomes zero. It can happen, right? Because the word problem is very hard. If you have a present, I give you a presentation. You cannot tell me that the presentation is um, presentation of a trivial group in finite amount of time. Right? There is no algorithm. Okay, but it you'll see an example where it will become relevant in the process. Oops. One second. Ah, where was I? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Great. Don't worry. I won't go through the whole slides. <laughs> That's just for I'm written it down everything. Um. Okay. Yeah. So I was here. Let's see. Yeah. So here is the main theorem. This is this is all I'm going to prove today. G is a group acting without inversions on a tree X, and let F be the fundamental edge. Be a fundamental edge. So uh, instead of fundamental domain, which is a, which is a subtree, I just have fundamental edge, just like S L two Z acting on um, that tree, right? The fundamental edge was just edge joining e to the power i pi over three and i. The following is the following are equivalent. So I haven't assumed the tree yet. I haven't assumed it's a tree yet. So following are equivalent. If it's a tree, then this this holds. Then G is actually amalgamated product of G P and G Q along. So huh. I haven't written it properly. So let me forget this drawing. Let me just write it precisely here. G is just isomorphic to amalgamated product of GP and GQ along GE. Just what you'd expect, right? <laughs> because P and Q, of course. But okay. So why is this true? So let's see. One direction would suffice. I mean, the other direction is also true, but we'll prove one direction for now. 
effect of a group acting on a tree so it seems that rithvik uh, is uh, in the waiting room but uh, he is uh, he is not okay mike okay thank okay okay sorry all right so yeah so g is a group acting on a tree without inversions and this is a fundamental edge joint uh, joint p and q two vertices and an edge between them the following are equivalent uh, well i'll prove one direction that if x is a tree then g is isomorphic to the amalgamated product of gp and gq along the stabilizer of g stabilizer of e okay so proof part 1 so i'm assuming x is a tree everywhere yeah x is a tree i'm doing one direction only if x is connected uh, okay let's see so so part 1 is x is connected so i'll give an elementary proof of this because i'll i've given algebraically proof of proof of too many things so let me give an elementary proof of this this part if x is connected x is connected if and only if g is generated by gp and gq why is this true so take take your tree so your tree is something like this yeah and look at the fundamental edge everything is a transfer of this right um yeah so let y be the component of x containing f i mean if if gp and gq both generate then of course y has to be i mean y has to be all of x denote g prime to be everything in capital everything in capital g which fixes uh, this component of x containing f the fundamental edge note that for any little g in capital gp or little g in capital gq so little g in the stabilizer of vertex p or little g in stabilizer of vertex q ge the edge translate of this edge by g shares a vertex with e right because if g is from gp it will fix p and the edge will be something like this if g is from gq it will fix e and q uh, it will fix q and the edge will be something like this yeah so any translate by gp or gq of this edge will share a shared a vertex with e originally original e right so ge has to be in y as well so for all g in gp or gq gy is contained in y right because anything in y is really connect something which is connected to e but connections with e the property of being connected with e is preserved under multiplication by elements of stabilizers of the vertices so gy is in y for all g in gp union gq so what this means is the gp union gq is contained in g prime stabilizer of this component so gp union gq is contained in the group generated by gp union gq is a subgroup of g prime conversely uh, i'll prove that g prime is equal to this group right so g prime is also contained here so conversely just note that if you look at gp union gq the subgroup generated by them and then look at the translates of the fundamental edge under that subgroup and look at all the elements in the complement of gp union gq and look at translates of f under that under 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 this under this uh, under these elements these are disjoint right this cannot be cannot be the same um i mean they, they cannot intersect right so therefore this this forces that one of them has to so x prime has to contain g this 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 part right because because this gp union gq f contains the edge f and contains everything connected to f as well i mean so it has to contain everything connected to f as well because this this part is because the the, the 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 these two are form a partition of um form a partition of x right sorry what's x prime x prime is ha huh, let me go back oh yeah I so i didn't define x prime yeah so one second what i mean is here uh, what i mean here is um y thank you what i mean here is y yeah that's what i mean 
y is contained in gp union gqf that's why i can conclude that g prime is is a subgroup of gp union gq okay because anything from g prime fixes y so it fixes gp union gq as well i mean it has to be contained in gp union gq as well okay so i hope this is clear i mean it's kind of clear if you if you think about it a little bit because i mean so what we're doing is we are partitioning uh, we're looking at all the translates of f by the group generated by gp gp and gq and everything else is not connected to that 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 that, that subgroup span the subgraph spanned by the um, translates of f by gp union gq so so it has to contain x prime right because they both it has to contain y right because they form a partition of the whole graph x and y is a kind of component so it has to contain y if it contains something in y it has to contain all of y but if it contains all of y then g prime is g prime which is the stabilize which is which is the which is the set of elements which fixes y i mean in relieves y invariant not fixes y but leaves y invariant has to be contained in gp union g so g prime is actually equal to the uh, sub so subgroup generated by gp union gq when what does this accomplish x is connected if and only if g equal to g prime right x is connected if and only so x is connected implies that y is all of x so x is connected if and only if y is all of x if and only if g prime equal to g but g prime is also equal to the subgroup generated by gp union gq so g equal to g subgroup generated by gp union gq so this proves fact 1 this is proof fact 2 x so there there is a map gp star gq amalgamated along g to g so what is this map Ma map is easy enough um well the map is just you send any element here which has to look like what okay one second yeah so if you if you take an element from gp so let's say little gp you just send it to um gp if you take an element from little gq uh, capital gq so let's say gq you send it to gp there are canonical injections from both of these factors to g and that that gives you a map gp star g gq to g right you just write so what 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 is an element here an element, element here is a word on elements of gp and gq right so bunch of elements of gp then bunch of elements of gq then bunch of elements of gp so on so forth you just send each of those elements to what it what it what that element means in g right because gp and gq are both subgroups of g g was acting on it right? gp and gq are stabilizers but what can happen is that this map, this map need not be injective or surjective for that matter but it is surjective because part 1 part 1 implies it's surjective x is connected because g is generated by gp and gq so it may not be injective it can be zero some there, there can be more relations here than just these relations because this is the this is the largest group given by gluing gp and gq along g right the only relations are that elements of g just become i mean so if you look at some element of g here and then look at it as as a element of gp look take an element of g look at it as an element of gq because g is just gp intersection gq right we talked about that stabilizer of the edge is just intersection of the stabilizers of gp and gq of p and q and then so for example you take an element little g here look at it as an element of gp then look at it as an element of gq then take this element times this element inverse that should be identity both here and here but so so therefore the map is well defined because all the relations are preserved but there can be more there can be more relations here making more words um making making more words here um zero in some word zero here so why is this injective so we'll see that this injective if and only there is no circuit there are no circuits in x For example, a tree does not contain a circuit, so that that would prove our fact. 
So X contains a circuit if and only if what? If and only if there's a circuit in X, right? So if and only if there's a circuit in X, which is getting mapped to PQ. Because all of X is getting mapped to PQ, right? Because there is a map from X to X by G, which is a fundamental domain, this edge. So all of X, all of the tree is kind of folding back to this edge, right? So if you, if you have a circuit here in X, so that kind of folds into this edge here. Okay. So suppose the vertices of the circuit are V0, V1, V2, V3, so on and so forth. Since it folds into this edge, so what does folding mean here? You're acting by G and the quotient is, is this edge. So this edge, suppose V0, V1 is mapping to this edge here. V1, V2 has to fold in some other way. So it has to fold backwards, let's say. Right? So you're folding backwards, forwards, backwards, forwards, so on and so forth. Each of these edges are folding backwards and forwards. So, okay, so let's say that, that the, the group elements associated with these, uh, these actions are G0, G1, G2, so on and so forth. So G0, G, G0, V0 is equal to G1, V1, right? Because if V0, V1 folds this way, then V1, V2 has to fold the other way. Right. So G0, V0 and G1, V1 are I'm mapping, I'm mapping to the same thing. Right? V0 and V1 are mapping to the same. Um, no, that's not what I mean. Uh, one second. Yeah, V1 is mapping to the same thing under the action of G0 and G1. That's what I mean. G0, V1 is equal to G1, V1. Yeah. All right. And uh, G1, V2 equal to G2, V2, G2, G2, V2. Uh, one second, what did I write here? One second, just one second. I think I messed up here. Hmm. What do I actually mean here? One second. Yeah, G0, V1 equal to G1, and that should be true. And G0, V2 equal to G1, V2, G1, V2 equal to G2, V2, yeah. Because they are the same vertices here. So, um, yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. That's what I mean. So what, so what this means is that G1 inverse G0, that fixes vertex V1, that is that stabilizes the vertex V1, right? So write, write G1 inverse G0 to be as H1 inverse, let's say, or G0 inverse, you can write G0 inverse G1, right? So V1 equal to, this, mean, this means V1 equal to G0 inverse G1, V1. So G0 inverse G1, that stabilizes vertex V1. Yeah. So I'm writing H1 as to be G0 inverse G1, H2 to be G2, G2, G1 inverse G2. Okay. So HI fixes, uh, vertex, so one of these vertices fixes, fixes either P or Q, right? Either P or Q, but not both because the other vertex is mapping somewhere else. The edge is, the whole edge is not collapsing to a point, right? So finally, what you're getting is that G N V zero equal to G zero V zero because it's a cycle. Nth, nth guy is, is the vertex, zero, zero vertex itself. So GN V0 equal to G0 V0. So that means if you expand GN in terms of all of these H1 to HN, so you get H1 to HN V0 equal to V0. So H1 to HN is either stabilizer of P or stabilizer of Q, but not both at the same time. Huh. So there exists a sequence of elements which are either, stabilize, either a stabilizer of, G, of, of P or a stabilizer of Q, but not both, such that their whole product is uh, identity because I'm, I'm so what I did was I, I took this to be H0 or H0 inverse. So their whole product is identity, but each of them belong to one of these groups. So in GP star GE GQ, each of these elements H0 to HN belongs to one of these groups. Also, H0 and H1 do not belong to the same group at the same time, right? Because they alternate, the edges are alternating. 
So consecutive elements of this product are, do not belong to the same group. H0, if H0 belongs to GP, H1 belongs to GQ. Right? So you, have, you get a word which is product of elements from each of these groups in the in the in the amalgamated product, but none of them are in are, are both none of them are in both, and also that uh, the consecutive pairs do not belong to the same group. But the product is identity. This can never happen. If you think about it, this can never happen in in um, in an amalgamated product. For example, so for example, if you take if you take Z star Z with just empty amalgamation here, right? You're amalgamating another trivial group. This is generated by X, generated by Y. If you take something like X, Y, X, Y, X, Y, this is not the trivial word. It can never be the trivial word if there are no XX inverses or YY inverses in the expansion. Consecutive elements have to belong to the same, there has to be a pair of consecutive elements which belongs to the same factor. This of course requires a proof, but you can kind of convince yourself that this is true. And this is ex exactly the technical part of the proof. That is why I'm not going there. So phi has no kernel. We have proven that phi has no kernel modulo details. So it is injective and also that phi is surjective. An application is that SL2Z is the amalgamated product of Z4 and Z6 along Z2. So in particular, it has a presentation of the following sort. So what is Z4? Z4 is just X such that X to the 4 equal to 1. Z6 is Y such that Y to the X6 equal to 1. And if you take the amalgamated product, what are you taking the amalgamated product along? You're taking the amalgamated product along um, the subgroup generated by X square on one side, Y cube on another side. So X square equal to Y cube, right? So this is the presentation of SL2Z. You learn what the group is explicitly by just looking at an action on the tree. And that is basically the application. And all of this has, I mean, this, all of this kind of simplifies if you, if you, if you, if you use algebraic topology, but I didn't want to go there, but I, I wanted to give some, some, some sense of an elementary proof. For those who know algebraic topology, I can say one more thing, perhaps not in full generality, but I can say that um, the, uh, the proof is two lines if you, don't, if you know algebraic topology. You don't have to think about anything at all. You take GP and GQ here, G here. This is, a, this is what is called a graph of groups. It's a diagram of groups. Uh, you take the classifying space BGP, classifying space BGQ here. I hope there are people who here who know algebraic topology. And you can take the classifying space BGE. So now what you do is you take the cylinder on BGE and then glue BGE to this, this side, BGE cross zero to BGP using the canonical map GE to GP. There's an inclusion map from GE to GP, inclusion map from GE to GQ. So you glue this side to this side and this side to this side. You get a map mapping cylinder basically. So then this complex has fundamental group exactly GP star GQ along GE by Van Kampen theorem. And the universal cover is exactly the tree. Yeah, so that's what, that's what I wanted to say. It's two lines if you know algebraic topology, but yeah. But yeah, this is a, this is a corollary of whatever we have done so far. Okay, I'll leave it at that. It's been, it, I've taken like half an hour more time. That's what I wanted to say. Uh, okay, thank you for the talk. Uh, yeah. So we'll meet tomorrow at 2 p.m. Yeah. Yeah, okay, uh, thank you everyone.